Are we ready? Yep. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you all today. My name is Lisa Levin, and I'm the CEO of Advantage Ontario. And it's my pleasure to welcome the Minister of Health, the Honourable Jean-Yves Duclos, the Minister of Seniors, the Honourable Kamal Kara, and MP Charles Souza to Sheraton Villa. For over 100 years, Advantage Ontario has been the trusted voice for not-for-profit seniors care in the province. Our 485 member organizations provide care and services to seniors all across Ontario, and they represent the full spectrum of not-for-profit seniors care in the province, including charitable, municipal, and hospital long-term care, seniors housing, supportive housing, and community services, such as this day program. Our members are deeply connected to their communities, from urban neighborhoods to northern and rural towns and ethnic, cultural, and religious communities across Ontario. Care is the heart is at the heart of everything we do, and that's why I'm so pleased to be here today. We are at a pivotal moment for seniors care in Ontario and right across the country. The last couple of years have been very challenging for the entire healthcare system. We all know that. They have, however, also put the spotlight on the importance of investing in and strengthening our long-term care sector. We have seen the provincial government take several important steps and make investments to do that, including a nation-leading commitment to four hours of care. But this is a national issue, and that's why today's announcement is so important, and why I want to applaud the federal government for taking an active role in ensuring seniors from coast to coast get the quality care they deserve. So it's now my pleasure to introduce the newly elected MP for Mississauga Lakeshore, who told me to call him Charles, to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and uh, thank you all, and welcome uh, to my colleagues to Mississauga Lakeshore, uh, one of the best ridings in all of Canada. And I can say that with confidence as someone who's lived here all my life, and my children and my family, have come to he I've come here and many other places like this to uh, be with you. And I, I congratulate the residents who are welcoming us into their home and enabling us to, to do this announcement today. Um, Lisa, you and your team have been extraordinary and thank you for your leadership. Thank you to the Region Appeal for their leadership as well and participating in some of these initiatives. And as someone, when I left politics in 2018 to start a long-term care and affordable housing complex for 350 units in, uh, in downtown Toronto, right on the subway line. I know how tough it is to bring things to speed and enable us to have good quality care and staff and a safe and secure home for our residents. I'm especially proud to be here with my colleagues. Um, the, you know, when I got back into politics, the welcome I received and the caliber of individuals that participate on your behalf as a voice uh, in Ottawa is extraordinary. Um, I've worked alongside Yvonne Baker uh, many times uh, when we were in, uh, in, uh, in the provincial side of things, and he's been a great leader and a champion. Sonia Sadu has come out many times for, uh, to, to help me as well and provide support for our community. Equinder Kahir is also a colleague now, and uh, thank you for all that you do in our community. And Chef Kat Ali is someone I've known for, I don't know, 30 years, I think, <laughs> in many engagements prior to politics. And that's what's really extraordinary about these individuals that they've cared long before they entered the political realm. And that says a lot. Um, I'm especially pleased here to introduce, uh, we have our two ministers here, champions in this respect. Um, and I know that Minister Kamal Kerry has been so good at trying to elevate the requirements to protect our citizens and our, our residents, our seniors, especially during the COVID issues. And she's been a champion on TV and elsewhere to bring and encourage people to come up to standards. And I know how important this work is. So please welcome Minister Kira. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, um, and thank you for that kind in introduction, Charles. Uh, our newest 
uh, you know, addition to our Peel family, and we're so happy to have you. Uh, and of course, I do want to acknowledge uh, my good friends and colleagues that are here today, MP Vaughn Baker, uh, my colleague and, and neighbor, Sanya Sadu, MP Shafkat Ali, Ikwinder here, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the mayor of Caledon, Annette Groves, that's here. Thank you so much for being here. And of course, uh, Lisa Levin, CEO of Advantage Ontario, for starting us off and, and for all the work that you do. And of course, it's always uh, a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And of course, uh, to all the residents that, that, that are here today, I want to say thank you. Thank you for wel welcoming us to your place. Uh, I know this is your home and this is uh, your, uh, you know, I, I really want to say thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to be here and, and to share some good news. Uh, and of course, it's always great to see my good friend and colleague uh, who I spent quite a lot of time, I feel like in the last little while, in the last few months, who's been very busy from coast to coast to coast, talking to Canadians uh, and our provincial and territorial governments to make sure how we can improve the quality Quality of care for uh, our citizens around this country and of course that is our colleague the Minister of Health uh, the Honorable Jean-Yves de Clos. and I want to begin by thanking Sheridan Villa for hosting us this morning you know during the pandemic our community in the region of Peel was one of the hardest hit regions in the country but despite it all everyone here at Sheridan Villa worked day in and day out to continue providing one of the best possible care for our residents. So for that, I want to say thank you. I also want to recognize and acknowledge the Health Standards Organization and Canadian Standards Association, and in particular, uh, Dr. Samir Sinha and Alex uh, Mihan Lidis. Sorry, I always uh, <laughs> butcher the name. Uh, but it truly is because of your time, your hard work, and dedication to serving and protecting Canadian seniors that we have made today possible. So I really want to say on behalf of all Canadians, thank you for the work that you've done. As Lisa said, the past three years have been extremely difficult for residents of long-term care, their families, and the staff who work in long-term care homes. And let's be clear, the pandemic exposed some uncomfortable truths and highlighted the devastating gaps that exist within our long-term care systems. You know, I can tell you as a registered nurse, I had the opportunity uh, to see some of these gaps firsthand. You know, when I put my scrubs back on and returned to volunteer at one of the hardest at long-term care homes in Ontario, not too far from here in Brampton, alongside the Canadian Armed Forces members. And you know, I will never forget the horrific conditions that residents and staff had to endure. And I carry those experiences with me every single day as a Minister of Seniors. At the same time, I will also never forget the immense strength and resilience of our nurses, our doctors, our personal support workers, and all the frontline workers that I had the honor of working alongside. You know, as we gather here today, I'm reminded of a PSW I met at the, uh, at, when I was volunteering at a long-term care. Her name was Heather. During the height of the pandemic, during the first wave, Heather did not go home for two weeks so she could care for her residents while the home was severely understaffed due to outbreaks. The amount of compassion and grit she showed during this time was truly remarkable. But we also know this story is just one of many that I know I've had the opportunity from here, from healthcare workers from coast to coast to coast. As, as a government, we knew that we needed to take action, which is why we created the Safe Long-Term Care Fund back in 2020. This fund transferred $1 billion to provinces and territories to protect people living and working in long-term care. We also knew we needed to support the development of the, the new national standards. That is why the Government of Canada provided close to $850,000 in funding to Health Standards Organization and CSA Group to support the development of these standards in a way that allowed the enhanced engagement and consultations that they did with Canadians. And as a result, both standards were shaped based upon the expertise and experiences of frontline workers, of residents themselves, the caregiver, their families, and the long-term care experts. And after receiving input from thousands of individuals from coast to coast to coast, Canadians can feel confident that their voices were reflected in these new standards. Again, I, I do want to take an opportunity once again to thank both HSO and CSA for the extensive work that you and your teams did 
uh, to have these uh, Canadian new standards because we know they are an important step in helping to ensure quality care for seniors as they will rise, raise the bar high to providing safe and respectful care in long-term care homes across Canada. Further, recognizing the urgent need to improve the quality of care in long-term care across Canada, we've also set aside $3 billion to help provinces and territories in their efforts to implement these new, new standards within their, their jurisdictions. Finally, we're also taking measures to support those working in long-term care, in particular, our personal support workers. We know that conditions of work become conditions of care. So on February 7th, our government, uh, part of the $198.6 billion for health care, put forward $1.7 billion over the next five years to create a $25 an hour minimum wage for personal support workers. This will ensure that people like Heather and many other PSWs across the country are paid a fair wage that reflects the critical work that she and others play in our health care system and in the lives of the residents. While we also have accomplished a lot, we know there is still so much work to do. These standards we're announcing today will provide guidance for delivering services that are safe, reliable, and most importantly, centered on the needs of residents. They will help ensure that seniors, no matter where they live, receive quality care that is rooted in dignity and respect. But let me again be very clear. The standards and the measures that we've outlined today is just one more step in our government's ongoing efforts to ensure that every single senior living in long-term care gets the absolute best quality of care possible. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your constant fight to promote uh, improved standards and safety for our citizens, and I commend you and thank you for all you do. And an individual has been a real leader. All of these people are leaders, but this individual has taken on a huge task to negotiate with the provinces and ensure that all of us are protected sustainably over time. And Minister Duclos, thank you so much for coming to Mississauga, well, Peel, but Mississauga Lakeshore in particular, <laughs> um, and again, for being such a, a strong voice in our caucus and a leader in Canada in fighting for the benefit for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Minister Duclos. Thank you, Well, obviously, good morning, everyone. Very pleased and proud to be in the wonderful community of Peel and in the most beautiful writing of the country, apparently. <laughs> Perhaps not far from Quebec, Quebec hopefully. <laughs> you know, we still have a lot of work to do in Quebec City to be on par with, uh, with this particular writing and this wonderful community in, in particular. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for uh, introducing uh, ourselves. Thank you, everyone that have helped uh, prepared this event uh, this morning, including the community here at Sheridan uh, Villa, uh, Keith and, and many others. You recognize yourself, yourselves. Uh, Samir and Alex, uh, as you've just heard, thank you for your leadership, your team, your team leadership in, in preparing all the great things that we already uh, spoke about. And obviously, uh, thank you to my wonderful colleagues, uh, Sonia, Ivan, Ikwinder, uh, Shkefkot, and obviously Kamal. Uh, it's great to be here, and I look forward to be invited again, perhaps at some point, uh, if, I, if, I, if I behave properly in your wonderful <laughs> company. Now, first, I would also want to thank uh, Minister Kara for her personal and professional commitment to the health of Canadians. As you know, that was in part demonstrated by her return to nursing during the dark days of COVID-19 in order to volunteer at a long-term care home, which was hard hit during the pandemic. But that was the case also of so many others who exemplified the devotion of our health workers and what, in, what it means to serve the public. Thank you, therefore, to all the health workers present here today and to all health workers across the country. We cannot understate the sacrifices that you've made throughout the pandemic, and you've given, you've given the best in spite of the many challenges that you had to address. Thank you for persevering. Seniors built our country, and every senior deserves to live in dignity and safety. 
And that's why the government of Canada is committed to help meeting the needs of seniors, including helping to ensure they can access the safe, quality health care they need and deserve, regardless of where they live. A few weeks ago, the Health Standards Organization and the Canadian Standards Association released new long-term care standards which provide guidance for delivering services that are safe, reliable, and most importantly, centered on residents' needs. They aim to foster competent, resilient, and healthy health workers, create safe physical environments, and promote a culture of quality improvement and learning across long-term care homes. The development of these standards complements our collaborative work with provinces and territories, as Minister Kerr said, to help support improvements in long-term care homes. While these standards are independent, our government provided nearly $850,000 in funding to the HSO and CSA to support, enhance engagement and consultations. Budget 2021 also provided $3 billion over five years to support provinces and territories in their efforts to improve long-term care in their jurisdictions. This is in addition to the $1 billion provided in the 2020 Fall Economic Statement for the creation of a, long, of a safe long-term care fund to protect people living and working in long-term care. Le 7 février 2023, le gouvernement du Canada et le Premier ministre Trudeau ont annoncé un investissement de 198,6 milliards de dollars sur 10 ans pour améliorer les soins de santé offerts aux Canadiennes et aux Canadiens dans quatre domaines de priorité communes. 1. Améliorer l'accès aux soins de médecine familiale. 2. Soutenir nos travailleurs de la santé et réduire par conséquent les listes d'attente des chirurgies. 3. Améliorer les services de santé mentale et de consommation de substances. Et 4. Moderniser notre système de santé et en particulier notre système de données en santé parce que les données, ça sauve des vies. Aider les Canadiens à vieillir dans la dignité près de chez eux avec un accès, avec un accès aux soins à domicile ou dans un établissement de soins de longue durée sûr est un autre de ces domaines prioritaires. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle nous investissons 1,7 milliard de dollars pour aider à bonifier le salaire et les conditions de travail des préposés aux bénéficiaires et des professions connexes. Cette bonification est essentielle pour améliorer les soins que nos aînés et nos patients reçoivent. Cela crée également un environnement plus positif et plus sain pour tous ceux et pour toutes celles qui vivent ou qui travaillent dans le secteur des soins de longue durée. En conclusion, notre gouvernement s'est aussi engagé à en faire davantage pour aider les aînés de tout le pays. Nous préparons un, pré un projet de loi sur la sécurité des soins de longue durée pour faire en sorte que les aînés reçoivent les soins qu'ils méritent, tout en respectant les compétences des provinces et des territoires. Au cours des prochains mois, nous procéderons à des consultations et à des échanges avec les intervenants au sujet de cette loi. Merci. Thank you, everyone, and looking forward to answering questions and comments. So thank you very much, uh, Ministers du Duclos and Cara, for today's announcement uh, about making the vision for stronger seniors' care in Canada a reality. And now the ministers will take questions from the media. Uh, just wait a minute. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, ministers. Uh, so we'll take questions from the media. We also have people online, so I'll ask you to uh, kindly ask you to follow up uh, one question and one follow up only. Uh, merci tout le monde. Nous avons uh, également des gens en ligne, donc je vous demanderai de vous limiter à une personne, uh, une question et un follow-up. Please come to the microphone to ask your question so people online can hear you. Thank you. And please, of course, yes, of course. Uh, bonjour, Monsieur le Ministre. Bienvenue à Mississauga. Simon Dingley from CBC News, sir. Uh, can we just get you at the microphone, sir? Et j'ai une question en français après aussi. Uh, Minister, why is your government given into the demands of uh, the pharmaceutical industry and abandon your commitment to bring down drug prices? Well, first, let us be very clear. Drug prices, and in particular patent drug prices in Canada, are amongst the most, uh, the highest in the world, 
next to uh, the United States and Switzerland. And that's therefore why we have committed to reducing the cost of those drugs in Canada. We know how important it is to do this for people to have access to those drugs in a manner which is both accessible and affordable. And that's why in June, just a few months ago, we did announce through regulation that there would be a new basket of countries, 11 countries, excluding the United States and Switzerland, Switzerland, where drug prices are very high, so that we can then work with the industry and make sure that drug prices in Canada are closer to what they should be and what they are across the rest of the world. Et en français, s'il vous plaît. Premièrement, soyons très clairs, le coût des médicaments brevetés au Canada est parmi les plus élevés au monde, juste en dessous de ce qu'on observe aux États-Unis et en Suisse. Et c'est pour ça qu'en juin, donc il y a quelques mois à peine, on a annoncé que, par un règlement que le coût des médicaments devait maintenant être comparé à un nouveau panier de pays, un panier de 11 pays qui reflète davantage la réalité des prix ailleurs euh, dans le monde, en excluant les États-Unis et la Suisse, où les coûts des médicaments sont beaucoup trop élevés. Et c'est pour ça que depuis le mois de juin, l'industrie pharmaceutique comprend très bien qu'elle va devoir revoir à la baisse ses perspectives de coûts des médicaments brevetés au pays au cours des prochaines années, parce que c'est un nouveau panier de pays qui va être utilisé pour euh, guider les décisions du Conseil d'examen des prix des médicaments brevetés. Et mon deuxième question, Monsieur le ministre. How does your decision to intervene and stall drug price regulation impact the affordability of a national pharmacare strategy? If, isn't this required by the NDP in your agreement with, with that party in your, your current agreement? First, PMPRB is a totally independent organization. It is not subjected and it will never be subjected to political interference. Second, PMPRB is obliged by legislation to consult with partners and, 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 and leaders uh, and experts across Canada when uh, changes are being asked to be made by PMPRB. And again, the change that PMPRB now needs to implement is a change that, was, that came through regulation in June, which asked PMPRB to set prices according to a new basket of countries, which exclude the United States and Switzerland, where drug prices are very high, and, uh, and ask the industry to align with the cost of drugs elsewhere in the world, with a basket of countries that is more representative of where we want to be, where we want to see prices uh, in Canada to go to. Now, in that context, they are therefore consulting. They ask for my, 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 my view as a, as a health minister. I ask them, at first, I reminded them of the importance of implementing that regulation announced in June. And second, I invited them to do the right amount of consultation so that this would be done in the most proper, the most efficient, and the most uh, speedy po manner possible. Okay, la même question en français, s'il vous plaît. Tout d'abord, sur le lien, euh, sur l'autonomie du Conseil d'examen des prix des médicaments brevetés, ce Conseil est totalement indépendant. C'est un Conseil quasi judiciaire qui ne doit pas être soumis à aucune influence politique. La deuxième chose, c'est que ce Conseil, par la loi, a l'obligation, lorsqu'il fait des choses importantes comme ce qui est en train de se produire maintenant, de consulter des experts, des leaders, des partenaires, y compris le ministre canadien de la Santé. Et c'est ce qui s'est produit dans les dernières semaines. J'ai, la, comme la loi le demande, j'ai fourni euh, mon opinion. Mon opinion était à deux niveaux. Premièrement, que le Conseil avait évidemment l'obligation de mettre en place le, 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 le règlement qu'on a annoncé en juin dernier, un règlement qui va avant, avant, aligner davantage les prix des médicaments brevetés au Canada à ceux qu'on retrouve dans d'autres juridictions à travers le monde où les prix sont plus faibles. Et la deuxième chose, c'est que ce, ce, médic, ce, 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 ce règlement devait être mis en place rapidement avec des processus et des directives qui demandaient un bon niveau de consultation, parce qu'on veut que les directives que le Conseil est en train d'élaborer soient de bonnes directives, solides, fiables, euh, qui nous amènent rapidement et correctement à euh, une baisse du niveau des prix des médicaments brevetés, comme on le souhaite à travers le règlement de juin dernier. Moira Welsh, Toronto Star. Um, I understand, as, as we all do, that the uh, federal government has said that the long-term care standards should be left to the provinces in terms of making them mandatory. 
but for example, Ontario gave a fairly um, muted or perhaps a, a cold reception to the standards when they were released. So what will the federal government do to ensure that they're actually picked up and not just left to be ignored by a great many homes? Well, that's a great question, and Minister Kera might want to, uh, to, to add to what I'm going to say. The first thing is that this is all good news. You know, thanks to the work of uh, Alex, uh, Samir, and obviously their team, thanks to the hard work of workers in, during COVID-19, we are, we are a lot, and thanks to what Canadians also did, uh, in, in part through being more aware of the difficult working and living conditions that we, that we knew existed prior to COVID-19, which were made a lot worse during COVID-19. Thanks, thanks to all of that, we're able to announce these improvements in, 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 in standards for care and work in long-term long -term care homes. So this is great news. No, and that great news is supportive of the work, the collaborative work that we need to do between the federal and the provincial governments. That work it, you know, is, is on different, many, different, uh, at many different levels. First, we know that those standards will be, almost, will be immediately incorporated in the standards that will be used by lots of long-term care homes in Canada, because in Canada, lots of long-term care homes already subscribe to the norms of, of, of uh, HSO and CSA. So it's automatically built in when those norms are updated. Now they immediately enter into um, the, the work of the long-term care homes, the workers, and the patients. The second thing is that, as Minister Kara said a moment ago, there are $3 billion that we're going to be investing in support of the work of provinces and territories to try to, 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 try to lift up the working and living conditions in long-term care homes in this province in particular. These are significant dollars that will obviously come in addition to the dollars that we know that the province of Ontario uh, will be investing in, in improving working and living conditions in long-term care homes. Now, in addition to that, there will be a long-term care act that will, be, uh, that will be tabled in the next few months that is going to be, again, uh, informed and enhanced by the hard work of so many people in the last, uh, in the last few months. So this is good news, but there's a lot of work to do. Because including in my writing, before COVID-19, I was aware, and many people were aware, that living and working conditions in long-term care homes were suboptimal. Sub but COVID-19 you know, gave all of us a, 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 a terrible uh, knowledge of how things could be, uh, could be very critical. So this is good news, but the, 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 the hard work is, is significant uh, and, and important, and therefore um, looking forward to doing it with, uh, with uh, Minister Kera. By the way, I'm just being told that uh, Saskatchewan uh, has now uh, announced that it has signed a, uh, an agreement in principle with the Government of Canada that, uh, that is now eight um, provinces uh, out of 10 that have signaled their agreement in principle uh, with the offer that was made by the Prime Minister just uh, three weeks ago. This is again good news because healthcare has many dimensions. Long-term care is one of them, but proper long-term care services require a strong healthcare uh, system overall, in particular through access to family medicine, uh, long-term care home, community care, um, home care, that's all connected to a strong healthcare system, again, uh, through and which we will be supported in part through the investments that Mr. Prime Minister Trudeau announced uh, just three weeks ago. Minister Kera, I, I spoke quite a lot. Would you like to add, to add a few things? Thank you. Um, to, just to add to what uh, Jeanne just mentioned, I think first, let me just say, I think seniors deserve the best quality of care, regardless of where they live in this country. And the reality is, I think we've seen here in Ontario, um, we knew how devastating this pandemic had been for our seniors, uh, many of them living in long-term care homes. As I mentioned, I've seen some of that in my own riding in, in Brampton, which one of the long-term care homes, which is one of the hardest in Ontario, and so is I know my colleagues' uh, ridings. Um, so these standards that the work that they've done with, you know, with Dr. Sena and Alex's team, uh, in terms of consulting with Canadians, I mean, they took over two years to really look at where some of the gaps are. The work they did listening to residents themselves, you know, healthcare workers, uh, you know, the long-term care experts, 
these are Canadian standards. This is what Canadians expect. Uh, we have saw those gaps and they are addressed in this. And I think the goal is to now make sure that we work with provinces and territories to implement these standards. As, as Johnny mentioned, I think 68 percent, I think it's close to 68 percent of, of uh, long-term care homes that will already be accredited by you know, the, the standards that HSO and CSA had built. There's $3 billion that we put aside to make sure standards of care are met and that permanent changes are made. Uh, and we're going to make sure we work, of course, as, as jean and others have been doing from coast to coast to coast. We get it right. I mean, this is about improving the quality of care for residents uh, throughout the country. Uh, this is a really good news, uh, and, and we look forward to getting to it. I mean, one thing I'll also add is it's not just about making sure we're supporting those living in long-term care homes, but also supporting those working in long-term care homes, because we know conditions of work become conditions of care. Uh, and that's why the, uh, the, the part of the big, biggest package that we announced with $198.6 billion, we've carved out $1.7 billion to make sure we're fulfilling our mandate commitment that we made to PSWs to increase their wages to a minimum of $25 an hour. We know there are some of the frontline workers um, at, at, in home care and long-term care homes, and we need to make sure they're supported. And so there's many things that we're doing, and I think it's, it's about making sure we, at the end of the day, I think it's about making sure we improve the quality of care for residents, uh, regardless of where they live, and that's exactly what we're doing. Thank you. Hello, ministers. I just want to follow up on my colleague's question. Um, first off, two parts. Why not just make it mandatory to ensure these standards will be adopted in all the provinces? And secondly, is there any part of this that includes enforcement to ensure these standards will be followed? Thank you for the, the question. So let me be a bit more clear. First, these standards in many cases automatically feed in the standards that are being, um, are being met and being asked to be met by lots of long-term care homes in Canada. Second, these standards are going to inform other standards used by other organizations like CARF. Uh, about 40% of long-term care homes in Ontario um, um, use CARF standards to assess whether their working and living uh, conditions are appropriate. And we've heard and we've seen over the last few weeks that because of the hard work that, uh, that CS um, CSA and HSO did, that hard work is going to feed into the norms and the standards that will be incorporated in other um, accreditation um, uh, systems. Third, the three billion dollars. This is going to be there to increase prevention, control, prevent safety of living, the quality of living in, in long-term care homes. It's going to be there to invest in infrastructure, better ventilation, uh, supporting the working conditions of workers. Again, it's also going to be used by provinces and territories to make sure that there are inspections and possibly enforcement measures that can be uh, used and applied when long-term care uh, conditions do not meet those, those standards. So there, there's a range of ways in which our collaborative work with provinces and territories, including with Ontario, can be used to support the quality and the safety of working and living in long-term care homes. And in terms of the, the rollout of the $3 billion to the provinces and territories, is there a criteria they have to meet and how are we going to determine how this will be allocated where? That's a great question. Uh, the, the, the money will start flowing this year for the next five years, three billion over, over five years, and we will be uh, inviting provinces to submit what they want to do with those, those dollars. So we know already, because of the, the, the work that we've done uh, uh, together, we know already that they will want to invest in, 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 in workers, they will want to invest in the quality of life for, for patients, they want to invest in infrastructure, the buildings, the rooms, the, uh, you know, the, the, the community rooms like this one, we know they will want to invest in uh, 
uh, in encouraging more long-term long care homes to being accredited. In Ontario, about 20 percent of long-term care homes are not accredited, so we know that the province will want to help more of those long-term homes uh, be accredited. And we know that they will want to invest, as we just said, in, in more inspections and more enforcement if, those, if enforcement measures are needed. I think we're good with question on the ground. We have a question online, so I'll pass it over to uh, the Health Canada media team online. To you. Thank you. We will now proceed to questions from journalists on Zoom. If you are a reporter and you wish to ask a question, please use the raise your hand function. Please indicate your name and media before asking your question. Nous allons maintenant prendre des questions des journalistes sur Zoom. Si vous êtes journaliste et vous désirez poser une question, veuillez utiliser l'option de lever la main. Veuillez identifier votre nom et votre média avant de poser votre question. We have one question here that we'll start with from Tessie, Chan Tessie Sanchi, Hill Times Research. Good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, as uh, the moderator said, I'm Tessie Sanchi from Hill Times Research. I just want to clarify, uh, respectfully, ministers, I don't actually know what the new information is today. Maybe that came out in what you said in French. So can you clarify exactly what the news is around this announcement? Because what I'm hearing is reiterating previous spending commitments. We're, but we're here today in the presence of Samir and Alex in particular, and obviously in this wonderful community. We are here to announce officially these, uh, these, new, uh, these new standards and to let Canadians know how they will be uh, useful to support other things that we now need to do, including, as we've said, you know, working with other uh, organizations like CARF in, 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 in Ontario uh, that we know will want to use those standards to improve their own standards. We know that uh, that particular accreditation um, path in Ontario is important for around 40 percent of long-term care homes. We, almost, we also want to signal this morning that with the uh, assurance of those new standards, we are now even uh, more able and certainly more uh, in, including more willing and eager to work with Ontario to see how we can use the $3 billion that was announced in the previous budget to support the uh, implementation of those standards and therefore improve the working and living conditions in long-term care homes in this province and elsewhere in Canada. So my follow-up would be then, you referred to the $3 billion from Budget 2021. You did make a reference to provinces applying for this money. Um, when you're discussing how this money can impact long-term care homes, are you directly bringing this up to provinces? Even if you're not legislating it, you're saying, hey, we have these standards, how much of this can you do? That, that's, a fair, that's a fair statement, exactly that. No, we know that there, there's a need for more resources to improve the quality of life and work in long-term care homes. There's more than that, but resources, dollars matter. So that's why uh, this, this, there's a great, the great news this morning is that we have uh, ways, uh, we have guidelines and standards to improve life and work in long-term care homes, and the federal government is eager to provide these additional resources to support provinces and territories in, in achieving uh, greater quality and safety of life and work in long-term care homes. So, but that's not, not, not going to be a surprise to, uh, uh, to provinces and territories because we've, we've made that, uh, that clear during COVID-19 that we wanted to be a stronger partner, knowing that it's a, it's a provincial jurisdiction. Now, let's me be, let, me be very, let us be very clear on that. Now, these standards, cannot be imposed by the federal government. No, long-term care homes, the running long-term care homes is a provincial jurisdiction. So there's, it, it should be no ambiguity. The federal government will not ever claim that it has a, the, the responsibility or certainly the jurisdiction, the, the competence of, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, organizing long-term care homes in Ontario in particular. However, given what we've seen in COVID-19 and the great level of collaboration and support that exists, that has existed between the different levels of government, we know that the federal government has a great, greater responsibility now to support long-term care uh, residents and workers. Thank you, Minister. That uh, concludes the questions from Zoom, so I'll turn it back over to the room. Thank you, everyone. This concludes the um, press conference. I would invite everyone to stay in the front for like an official picture. Uh, and also thank you uh, for the people of the Sheridan Villa for the warm welcome. Um, thank you.